good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Charlie. I am an associate professor at Swansea University. Um, and the um, my co-presenters who aren't able to make it today, <laughs> uh, they're invisible, are uh, Martin Nozek. So he um, actually created this online resource, Bedwyr Gulledge, who is a lecturer, and Shannon Meachin, who is another um, a clinical learning facilitator working with us at Swansea University. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a new um, escape room, online escape room that we trialled this academic year with our students. So um, we used it for our healthcare science students. So lots of you probably won't know what healthcare science is. Um, it's um, an NHS related uh, degree course, undergraduate degree course. Um, specialising, our students specialise in either respiratory or cardiac. Um, and what we were finding was that students were going on placement having no understanding of risks or hazards in their clinical area. Um, and they didn't have any wider thought beyond that of a student responsibility. So, for example, if you're um, a student, you're not responsible for setting up first thing in the morning. That's the staff member's job to do. And we found that the students were not necessarily taking uh, on board all of those components that made it up. A bit like if you're a passenger in the driver's um, in a car, you don't take as much notice of the directions or the traffic because you don't have to. So what we wanted students to do was to be able to identify um, risks, um, hazards and risks within their clinical area. So if they were to walk into a room, would they be able to think, OK, that could that could cause um, harm to my patient or myself or a carer, another staff member, etc. And how could I do things that would mitigate for those risks? Um, we a few years ago, we did this as a face to face session um, and we asked the students to complete written risk assessments, which were then marked by the staff, myself, um, Shannon and Bedwyr. Um, the downside was that it was a obscene amount of burden on the staff. Um, the risk assessments that we received were poor quality. They were done very quickly. Um, despite trying to emphasise the importance of them, risk assessments are not the most interesting things to do at the best of times. Um, and the students really struggled with grasping why they had to do it. Um, so they were poorly written. We were frequently sending them back, asking for edits before we'd actually say, yes, this is a good enough piece of work. Um, it was also time consuming to set the, we, we had a room set up, a physical room. Um, and that was time consuming to block the, the clinical rooms out because we didn't actually need them clinically. We just needed the space to illustrate the, the equipment in, in um, departments. Um, so that was a problem. So we decided to make it online. So rather than talking to you about it, um, I'm going to show you. And this is where I hope the link works. She says. Done. Hey, so can you see that now as well? Yeah, good. So um, the students had an introduction to uh, the resource. So just some basic instructions, how to navigate through, which I'll skip through quite quickly. And then they had a, a Microsoft Sway, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which outlined some basic theory and concepts behind what is a risk, what is a hazard, why is it important that I can identify them and mitigate for them. So they scrolled down and they got lots of information. There was a few tasks for them to do, and it was basically setting the scene. And then the students entered three different rooms. The first room I'll show you now. The first room was uh, a basic room, so they could click the hotspot that they could see in front of them and it would come up with some basic instructions. Um, the instructions were essentially um, don't make it full screen. Use your mouse to drag around the room and you'll find other things to click on. So the students should click on things. And then in this first room, we provided the students with lots of answers. So we identified what the hazard was. We identified how it might pose as a risk. We identified what control risk um, mitigations and um, controls were already in place. Um, and we also gave them examples of additional things that could be done. Um, 
we then posed additional questions for them and under there was a little bit more information that the students could explore. Now with each um, risk or hazard that the student had to click on, you can see one letter was highlighted or underlined or bold within the title of the hazard. So what the students had to do was to work their way around the room um scrolling there's another one click on it and now they had a different letter and they had to make a word with those letters so they scrolled around the room once they'd made a word with those letters they inputted it into the door and they could enter into room two so what i'd like to do just so that i'm not boring you if i can um i would like to send you if i stop sharing for a second send you a link to this resource and it's only going to be a couple of minutes but if you can click through um when you get to room one if you click the door the code is echo and if you submit that code you will then be able to enter room two and i just want you to have a couple of minutes playing around with room two for those of you that haven't got the capability of um, doing it at the moment, I will have a play around with you um, in silence. Just two minutes. OK, so I know that was very short and sweet, but I'm conscious of time. Um, so you get the idea room two was a little bit harder than room one in that we still identified specific areas for the students to click on, but we didn't actually provide them with the answers immediately. They had to think for themselves. So I'm now going to show you the final room. So this was room three. Um, so same principle, the students had to work out a code to get into room three. Now, room three was the hardest room. Um, room three had, again, an introductory, you know, bit with some um, some tips. Um, but there was no hazards, no specific points. That's the room to get out, the, the code to get out. So that's not anything to pick. Um, but there was absolutely nothing to click. Now, can you see the cursor changes very slightly there? So this was a hazard. So what was the hazard? Ceiling tile missing. And the student would work through. Um, and again, it was slightly harder, but these there was a letter in bold this time. And the student had to create the final um, code in order to get out of the room. Um, now this room, as there was uh, no actual hotspots, we did find put a hidden clue. So if the student clicked the light switch, they got told how many hazards they actually needed to find in that room. So we would need to find eight more. 
Um, and once the student has found eight more, then, oh, that's back, sorry, wrong door. Then they can go to this one, put the final word in, and that was the resource complete, and they got a, a little certificate at the end of it. So just going to go back quickly now uh, to the feedback. So student feedback then. Um, I start with this, um, the, the graph on the top. Um, so most of the students felt quite positively that it helped them understand the risks and hazards better in their workplace environment. But it was a little bit more neutral in terms of whether it was actually fun and engaging. A slightly positive shift, but nothing outstanding. Um, the majority of students did like it, however, that it was online and self-directed. Um, the bottom left um, bar graph just illustrates how hard the students thought the activity was. Um, so slightly skewed towards the harder side and this comes up again in the feedback quite um quite a lot with the students um so we asked students specifically what did they enjoy and what how, what could we do to improve so the things they enjoyed most about it was that it was engaging which is slightly contradictory to the um feedback in the top graph but there you go um interesting informative interactive one student actually said that they were hooked um and they couldn't stop until they'd completed it all which was very sweet um and then the things that we could do to develop it um the majority of feedback was around room three so lots of students thought that room three was too hard and we had wondered whether it was going to be difficult finding those nine hazards when there wasn't an awful lot to um, of other hints to go by. Um, they also found that the actual uh, area to click was quite small. So they might be like that ceiling tile. They might be clicking on the ceiling tile, but not in the perfect right space for the cursor to actually change. Um, one or two students said they would have preferred it being face to face. Um, so maybe that would have helped sway this kind of middle group that's that were not sure whether it was fun or engaging. Um, and my last. Oh, what's happened there? My last slide then just before I finish um, is about what we're going to do next. So we are going to try um, next year. Hopefully we're going to try it in person. So our simulation center um, is relatively new at Swansea. Um, and they have um, a 360 room, so this can be put up into the classroom so the students can actually go and press the walls and the screen. Um, so the same exactly the same setup can just be displayed, so it will be in person and done as a group. We're hoping then that might encourage a little bit more of that fun and engaging uh, feedback to shift um, more towards the right. It will still be student led, no staff in the room, they'll just be there to help with technical difficulties. Um, we also didn't actually monitor the attendance, uh, like completion rate for this. Um, and so perhaps having it face to face will encourage that completion. Um, we're going to make the hotspots a bit bigger so it's a bit easier to click on um, and maybe focus on a couple more quizzes or riddles to help in room three. Um, because there was quite a lot of feedback on that being a bit too difficult. Um, they like the fact that it progressed in difficulty from um, room one through to room three, though, so we're going to keep that the same. Um, and then once we've tried it face to face, we're going to evaluate it and see how that compares and work out whether students actually like it as a completely online resource, just as we've done, or whether they would prefer it being um, kind of a mixed um, using simulation, but doing something face to face. Um, and that is going to be me. I've done talking. I just want to give um, a special notice of thanks to Martin Nozek because he is the guy that um, developed and created all of this. Um, we were just the bossy ones that asked him um, to do it. And that's me done. Well, hi, everyone. So I'm Dr. Matthew Johns, lecturer in physiology at the University of Salford. And today I want to showcase mine and my colleague Nikki, who's hopefully in the chat, um, our escape room platform and talk a little bit more about some of the challenges that we faced in designing and evaluating a digital only escape room platform. So I just want to start by thanking the organisers for inviting me to give this talk to you guys here today. 
So I want to start by introducing our platform, very nicely called UOS Scape. Um, and we designed it as a universal platform for the design and delivery of digital escape rooms from all programmes across the institution. So rather than being a platform that's very specific for one subject area, we wanted to make it as inclusive as possible to everyone across the institution. And there's a variety of different reasons why we wanted to do this. The first one was to increase our gamified learning provision across the institution, something which we do in drips and drabs, but making sure that, that there was a central place. If anyone wanted to do digital escape rooms and add that to their curricula, there was a place where they could come and they could put those resources. And that would hopefully help us build a collaborative institution-wide network of people interested in this kind of technology and this type of gamified learning. We wanted it to be open access, so anyone who was interested could come, they could design their own rooms, their own escape games, and trial it through our system and provide that more general flexibility from all subject areas, irrespective of whether they're a more hard science, like what myself and Nikki come from, into those more social subjects as well, making it inclusive for everyone. And one of the key things I wanted it to do was align to real situations to try and make them as authentic as possible. So whether that's from helping students understand and locate and navigate around sort of university core facilities, central spaces, helping with that transition from further education into higher education in initial phases, all the way through to setting up rooms designed in hospital laboratories or external sites that mirror what goes on in the real world once they ultimately graduate. So what have we achieved so far? So what we have done is we've managed to design this platform to host these escape rooms. And I'll talk a little bit more how we've done that in a minute and some of the challenges we've faced. And so far we've successfully designed and built two different escape rooms one based around the topic of microbiology designed as a revision tool for first year biomedical science and wider biomedicine undergraduate students and our second one in collaboration with our business school is the business boardroom which is designed to support the transition and induction of postgraduate students to the business school so much broader much wider in scope and these were all developed through sort of extensive testing and co-creation with students to an, and wider academic staff within the area to make sure that all content was relevant and addressed known areas of challenge, especially the revision tools to try and make sure students were learning relevant information within our escape games. And we have then subsequently conducted preliminary investigation to identify what students thought of our rooms and the platform as a whole. So this is our initial findings. So we found that when we evaluated our pool of students, 100% of students stated that they had a positive experience with 82% highlighting this as this type of learning as better than their traditional didactic approach to revision sessions. And when we asked more qualitative questions, such as did you find it visually appealing and more technical questions around the platform? So did it work well on your device? Was it well developed? Students mostly gave a majority positive response. The only exception for that was around the navigability of the room. And I'll touch more on that when I talk about some of the challenges we faced later on in the talk. But we also ranked the types of puzzles that we used. So we developed a league table system to identify which puzzle did our students find most enjoyable, which did they find most challenging and difficult, the most interesting and which ones enhanced their knowledge to try and ascertain which puzzle types would be most suitable for different kinds of applications. So for example, you can see that when we have a look at our league tables on the right hand side, that the jigsaw, which is relatively easy, was the most enjoyable thing within the escape room, whereas the crossword, which requires students to have that core knowledge, they found most challenging, but it did ultimately enhance their knowledge to the greatest extent alongside the jigsaw. 
So there's a trade off between the puzzles that you design relative to the room that you want. So what did we ultimately learn from this experience thus far? So we identified that students did like our platform and found it a valuable addition to support their learning in the first instance. But one of the main issues associated with it was the ease of navigation. So overall, relatively positive results and quite informative for further development of the platform. However, there were challenges that we came across along the way, and this is what I wanted the main body of the talk to be about is what did we find and what can we share with anyone else interested in developing their own platform before they initiate the process. So the first of these was finding a suitable platform that met all of the criteria that we wanted from our platform. Managing procurement and ensuring the long term sustainability, especially on relatively short learning and teaching grants with finite um, amounts of time to spend the funds associated with that. Making sure that we designed rooms that met and aligned to the needs of academics and students. And then our final challenge was encouraging student engagement and then ultimately gathering feedback from our students, which is quite challenging with an online only platform. So I'll start with how we found this suitable platform. So challenge one, where do you even begin? So I had quite a lot of criteria that I asked Nikki to have a look for when we were trying to find a suitable platform. I wanted it to be relatively easy to code as me or Nikki are not computer scientists. We are very much wet lab based scientists, so coding is not our area of expertise. We wanted something that was relatively readily available and externally facing to support some of those widening participation activities, as well as student recruitment and admissions related activities as well. We wanted something that facilitated academic creativity and allowed our academic staff to come up with an idea and then integrate that directly into our website. Something that was relatively easy to maintain to allow us to continually develop this resource over time without having to either pay for external clients to redo the website every time we needed to make a change. So something we could adapt and change on the fly in response to students and staff feedback. And something cost effective and ideally as cheap as possible um, to allow for long term sustainability of the project and allow it to nice and easily slot into wider university budgets. So after extensive research, we decided to utilise WordPress as our main platform to underpin everything and utilising WordPress VR, we were able to create immersive um, 360 degree rooms um, to run our escape room in. And there's a few reasons why we chose WordPress over other available things. One is the external visibility. There's no need for a license to utilize this. It all comes built in. So whereas Thinglink has very similar, sim, um, very similar capability as WordPress VR, it may require an external facing license fee, increasing the costs to showcase this externally. It, WordPress is great because there's loads of videos out there on YouTube and other resources on how to actually code. So if you have a question or you're struggling with a particular element, you can just quickly search it on YouTube and there'll be some video showing you exactly how to fix the issue that you're having, which is great for us as non-computer scientists. There's a vast array of freely available plugins to allow for that academic creativity. And we would have access to all of the back end of the website, allowing us to make those amendments quickly based on feedback. And in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't prohibitively expensive. But again, I'll touch on that on the next slide. So like I said before, I wanted to make this platform as cost effective as possible to allow for that continual long term sustainability and continual development of the platform long term. So we were fortunate to be awarded a one year University of Salford Learning and Teaching Scholarship by our Learning and Teaching Enhancement Centre. And as part of the application that we put in, we costed for a single payment three year subscription to WordPress to allow us that longer term sustainability. However, 
this is where challenge two comes in. Institutional financial procedures. So for clarity, in case they ever watch this, our financial department is great. Our staff are really helpful, but the policies they have to enforce aren't helpful for very short term learning and teaching based projects especially when you're trying to buy things that they wouldn't normally allow you to do, such as third party plugins for a WordPress site. So with the scholarship only being one year in length, and despite it only being a payment, a single payment of, for three years, they wouldn't approve this procedure because the payment period, even though it was within the one year period, was over the one year lifetime of the grant. But they would instead let us pay monthly at a significantly greater cost to the institution, which I find a bit daft, to be honest. But with the security of LTEC and them stepping in and saying we would help support this, they did ultimately allow us to do that. Um, but we had to seek additional approval. Challenge three are unexpected and unforeseen costs. So during the development of our rooms, we came across many challenges associated with this. And from using that feedback, we decided that we needed to procure additional, more premium plugins to enhance the capability and navigability of our room in response to that feedback. And this required a credit card purchase from our finance department. And a credit card purchase is like the enemy of a finance department. They refused to do it unless you have exceptional circumstances. But luckily, once we got approval for that, we had prepared a small section of within the funding application to cover these additional costs in conjunction with travel and dissemination costs. So we were slightly prepared for this challenge, but if those, ex those unforeseen costs could have spiralled, we would have been in a position where we couldn't enhance this anymore. So it's something to think about going forward. What about actually building the rooms? So we wanted academic and student co-creation at the heart of our rooms, making sure that they could drive the direction of development going forward. So we initially set our pilot based in Nikki's own subject area of microbiology, as she's a microbiologist by trade and knew the area inside and out. So it was easy to design and scaffold the escape room to link into our curriculum. However, we had no idea where we wanted to go next. So we asked the students. And the students responded very nicely with these nice vague comments of anything but microbiology, any topic related to the degree, the other modules we study and every weekly lecture. At this point, we'd spent four months developing the prototype and students were asking for weekly lecture content provided through this platform. And we thought, great, that's a lot of work. But it, some of the feedback provided by students was helpful and through developing collaborations with academics within the centre, we started to build ideas outside of our own area. And this is where I come to challenge five is how do you start to find collaborators from other programmes and institutions? And this is something that I'm not particularly good at is the art of self promotion. So getting your ideas and your innovations out there to other people, not only outside of your own department and outside of your own team. So be prepared to do that. It's great having events like this where we can showcase our best practice in the field. Another thing I highly recommend is to seek support of colleagues as well as your learning and teaching enhancement centre if you have one at your institution as they are really good at bringing people together. Um, and a special thanks to Davina Whitnall and Craig Morley who have been excellent in helping us reach out to some colleagues across the institution. And then making sure that you attend showcase events such as this one and internal learning and teaching conferences to get your ideas out there and promote them to the wider public. So what about actually evaluating and getting students to engage with this? So one of the challenges we mainly faced in our pilot phase was to encourage student engagement and then ultimately evaluate the impact of this. 
So generally, student engagement is quite challenging across the sector nowadays, with many students taking on additional work burden due to the cost of living crisis that's occurring globally. And this is even more challenging when you're providing optional pedagogical preliminary investigations is trying to get students in to support those. So how do you get them to try it? We find focus groups are really good tools, especially if you promise that there'll be food there as well. Students will show up for free food. But what about getting that data? So students are becoming increasingly surveyed across the institution, whether that be evaluating modules, whether be it, it be evaluating programmes, whether it be evaluating the university as a whole, as well as other externally facing surveys such as NSS. So they get survey burden, they get survey burnout associated with filling in all of these surveys. But what they actually want and what we've heard from students who filled in our surveys is they want evidence that their responses actually make an impact and actually support and will be acted on by the researchers if they make a comment related to a particular element. So therefore, one of the things you should think about is your survey design. So rather than it being highly focused on the data you want for your research publication, make sure that it gives a student a voice and facilitates that co-creation alongside the students so that you can close that feedback loop making sure that students know that they are heard and that their voice has made a real change to the thing that you're developing. So overall, I'll just quickly go through conclusions. I know I'm a little bit over time. Digital escape rooms are an effective tool that can be used to enhance student experience and learning. We all know that from many of the great things that have been on show today. Initially setting up a digital escape room platform from scratch is very challenging and highly susceptible to factors beyond your direct control. So these should, wherever possible, be thought about beyond, before the start of development to try and minimise overall risk to the project. And gathering student feedback during preliminary phase can be difficult, but it is an essential tool for driving that co-creation and investment by students into the development of new learning resources. I just want to end by thanking Dr. Nikki Morgan, who's in the chat, who's done the bulk of the sort of work back end work on building these escape rooms and co-creating these alongside students and staff, as well as our learning and teaching enhancement centre and specifically Davina Whitnall and Craig Morley, who are supporting our learning and teaching scholarship. If you want to have a go at our escape room, there's a QR code on screen at the minute and I'll pop the link in the chat shortly. But if you're interested in hearing more or about potentially collaborating and using our platform, feel free to send me an email. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Claire, and uh, warmly welcome from Chile, Finland. The temperature is still plus five degrees and there are still snow left. So I think hopefully you have more warm inside. Uh, I'm really eager to be here to present uh, with the topic escape game pedagogy problem all problems or solutions. Uh, I will divide my presentation into two sections. First part will introduce our facilities related to escape lab. And the second part will introduce the actual term or the concept escape game pedagogy EGP. And thanks, first of all, Claire, of this uh, great event. As we are a small nation, we need collaborative uh, and collaboration and collaborative support from from outdoors. So I'm I'm really eager to be here today. So yeah, there were the content once more. So the characteristics of, of our uh, escape lab and defining the concept. These are the two main. Uh, topics today from me. So first of all, in a nutshell, a few things uh, um, and the perspective uh, how huge we have become in this past four years with the escape game pedagogy in our university. Uh, first of all, the story began in 2020 when we when we opened uh, the smart lock uh, escape lab. And at that point, it was quite unique 
physical space at academic uh, uh, contexts. And so far we had had about 7000 visitors, actual players, and we have reached uh, almost 40 percent of usage percentage uh, and the beginning was 10. So it has been a huge improvement. And so far we have had about 60 complete educational escape games from early childhood all the way to adult education. And we have done them also in physical, uh, but also in digital and in hybrid forms. So all these forms are, are uh, typical in, in our context. Uh, the latest thing what we finished last year was that we, we formed four educational expert products, uh, uh, including the massive online open course. And I will introduce the link to you a bit later. But if you are interested, it's quite cheap to, to get a certificate that you have completed one credit course. And then we have completed four different kind of projects uh, funded by, by the Ministry of Education and, and the Council of Education of Finland. And the uh, University of Eastern Finland has also supported our project uh, with a few hundred thousand euros. So almost 500,000 uh, euros we have invested to, to our facilities, but also to improve our uh, teaching method at our university. So uh, as Claire said uh, previously, before we started this session, that the first the event was small and now it has become uh, really huge. The same thing happened to us. First, we had a little thought that maybe we could do escape games part of the teaching, but then it became something like this. So we can't control it anymore. And that's that's a great thing to, to see that the small seedling has become a huge tree. And 21 courses at our university in different disciplines uses this teaching method already. So yeah, it has grown quite a lot. And we have done research uh, papers for four total and with pharmacists. I'm, I'm making the fifth one and we have three different laboratories at the moment uh, in teacher education, but also in pharmacy and also in the language center who is giving teaching in Germany, uh, Swedish and English uh, English lat, uh, languages. And in, um, uh, before Christmas 2020, we had the first educational escape game seminar like just like this in Finland. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here and it has been really great day so far. And about our smart look shortly, uh, we got the idea that we are uh, we have lack of uh, observation classroom at our university, and at the same time we wanted to bring along gamification and um, some something that would encourage the students to learn in different way. Uh, as we all know, the teaching culture needs to change, and that these were the driving uh, meters to to improve our teaching and. That's why we came up with the idea to apply some money from the university and, and we got the funding and, and then we got the nice learning and research facilities. The escape game was not the topic because I think the administration would, would not have given us money, but we formed this very nice term learning observation the classroom and then they gave us the money. And one of the ideas what I want to give to you if you are designing this kind of physical uh, learning environment, there are a lot of factors you need to take into account uh, while doing the designing process. And one of the first papers which we made was related to this designing process. And I would highly recommend you all to form a pedagogical design group along the actual design or, or the project group who's, who is doing consisting of architects and plumbers and so on. So you should have along this pedagogical group to give the pedagogical aspect for, for the designing process. And this was really good to, to make it more sustainable um, uh, conclusions and, and the final product was, was much more better. And first uh, 350 guests who visited our, in our space 
and played our game. Uh, we analyzed this uh, data and, and they totally agreed that this is very modern and very recent uh, way to keep teaching and it fulfills our curricular content contents as well. And we were really pleased to hear this from our visitors. Here is shortly the layout of the space. On, on the right side, there's the old version and on the right side is the new one. Oh, sorry, on the left side, we divided the space into four different places. The first one is the motivation zone where we give the instructions, where we have a little first talk and first ideas about the game and the content. Then we move on the second room, where is the actual game based uh, or the skill based zone where we have the game. And the third room is the reflection zone where we are having the uh, as welcome emphasized the briefing talk, which is really important part of, of the learning process. And on the other side of the hallway, we have the monitoring zone where the teacher can sit down and have a little drink of coffee or something else and lay down and actually have time for the observation, how the students are behaving and how they are working together. And we can record the data easily from, from that observation room. And here is the room about the observation room. It looks like a space shuttle <laughs> in the first glimpse, but it's really used and teacher friendly equipment to be used. And on the upper upper side wall, it doesn't look so all well organized. As you can see, it's it's all the time um, uh, in, a, in a hustle. People are coming and picking stuff from there and taking these to the school and to other classes and bring them and they don't have time to place them on the right places. So it looks like that all the time. Maybe it needs some more functional development in the future. And here are the uh, actual uh, playing rooms. What the teacher students have done, for example, this was uh, the picture under is um, I think it was a submarine or something, and the picture above is something like a villa um, murder mystery within a villa or something. So the themes have have been really really different so far. Oh, that was really short uh, time, but. Then I will move on to our e, um, escape room pedagogy or escape game pedagogy, what we have formed for our teacher students, them to get the theoretical background for their planning. So we have divided the content into two different pieces. So the first one is educational importance or educational characteristics. And the second one is learning achievements, or let's say this could be transfer virtual uh, 21st century skills. So all these pieces form together uh, the escape room pedagogy, what we, we try to use as a concept to, to illustrate what this is about. And I think today, everybody, if you have heard great uh, speeches today, you know what all of these mean. And actually, we have done also a guidebook for teachers in, in Finnish and in English uh, to, to provide easy tool to start with, because we know we, we have a, often a lack of time to uh, use new teaching methods. So that's why we wanted to give a really clear picture and a clear guidebook with all the evaluation forms, uh, all the uh, practical tips for the teacher to, to start and to do, develop the games. So here's the one of the picture what we gave to them. Start by selecting the group, defining the learning objectives or the aims, select the theme and space and time and, and so on and so on. And I would like to um, especially highlight the pilot of the game. Uh, there's always something unpractical or some mislead uh, hints or uh, wrong code in a box or something like that. It's it's very common. I think we all know it. So always we, we encourage to pilot the game with your friends or the teacher colleagues or, or teacher friends. And maybe the last one, don't do it again, don't waste it. Once you have started, you are in an endless swamp, uh, you get more excited about it and you just you you see all the time new gadgets, 
you have all the time uh, day and night you get new ideas it's 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 really awesome when you get into it and we had great lecture today about assessment but but few uh, uh, hints from Finnish perspective um, in every class we want to highlight three ways of, of uh, evaluating or assessment assessing the student as we know we use the diagnostic uh, assessment before the intervention in the beginning of the intervention of the class then the formative during the activity or, or the lesson and finally summative when we uh, have the final uh, debriefing session so that's why the final debriefing briefing session is also important that that we included part of the uh, total uh, assessment uh, like goal or the path let's say let's put it that way and what are the assessed targets the preconceptions what the students know about the new content achieving the aims in the formative assessment and then screen, uh, skill related actions what they are actually doing in the game how they are behaving themselves, how they are, uh, what kind of group dynamics they have. And in the end, summative, uh, how they are sharing their uh, learned ideas, how they are reflecting themselves, themselves, how they uh, think themselves part of the member of the group, how they are going to bring the the, the learned things into the future. As, as Welkam said, it's really important to think the step ahead how the learned thing is used in, in daily life or, or in further studies. So I will hand out this slide to you as well, but here, are, here were a few uh, highlights from this table. So as we are running into the final minutes, um, I think every time when we start to plan uh, the game with the with the students or with any anyone we we have to decide what is the uh, number of participants as we know in physical games we we can't have like tens or even hundreds of students or players then we have to move on on the digital form or or then hybrid or then transferable version so so this table has become really valuable for us for for the development phase or the de design phase that what can what do we have the resources and and what are the challenges and the benefits of the formation of the form of the game and here are some pictures during the three past years uh, it has been really fun and really really engaging and the teacher students they are really uh, inspiring source to develop everything new and also the younger students even the four year students here uh, four or five year students here in the in the town corner uh, they were really really keen on planning new games for each other even though they couldn't read or even they they couldn't uh, uh, calculate any mathematical things but but they were really really uh, inspired to make games for each each others and as I promised you in a cliffhanger, uh, I, I I will pass it, pass on the link in in the chat in a few moments where you can register to this massive online open course and complete this course and you will get the certificate from that uh, with a little little sum of money if you are interested and and finally thanks a lot for your interest and. There's a little QR code if you're interested on Finnish nature. I'm a biology and geography teacher, so I've made a little game for you as well. So we are free to get introduced with Finnish nature and with bears. Thank you for your time and thanks for all the questions. And I'm really interested to have more conversation.